So welcome everybody to our live webinar tonight. Uh, we're focusing on property and having a, a great in-depth discussion with a great panel of experts in their own rights across uh, all the main financial service fields. Uh, my name's Sebastian, I'm from Wealth Depot, so welcome here tonight. We've got, uh, we're gonna be discussing the rules of property and how, and how things have maybe have changed um, since we've, we've had to deal with the, you know, COVID-19. Some of, the, some of the strategies that we're, that we're finding that uh, seem to stand the test of time. And also some of the things that have changed around property transactions and what landlords and tenants need to be focused on. Um, how, how people can obviously still get involved with the property sector and some of the opportunities that are, are, are available to us. Um, not, not just in direct property, but also in the greater, greater sector around office, uh, industrial and the like. So, Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just to get the ball rolling, uh, we've got uh, Brett Warren and Josh Sawyer from uh, Metropole Property Strategies. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen now so we can see the presentation. Hopefully that's gonna be working in a second here. Uh, can everybody see the presentation yet? <laughs> so everyone can see the screen yet? Yeah. Is that right? Okay, great. So, so Brett and uh, Josh, I guess, uh, welcome. Um, and I appreciate your time tonight to, to give us and our, and our uh, guests some insights about what you guys do day to day and, and what you're seeing on the ground regarding property and, and how you help those first time buyers and investment property buyers um, navigate the market and, and, and provide us a bit of opportunity. As you see there, you've got a Quite, a, quite an extensive uh, you know, resume and CV of, and you've been around property for a very long time. So without further ado, Brett, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Sebastian, and um, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Uh, it's probably a very popular question at the moment, what's happening with property, but just, just a little bit about us before we start and who we are. Um, we've been around for close to 40 years. We were, we were founded by, back in 1979 by Michael Yardney, um, who's still very heavily involved in the business down in, um, in Melbourne. He's based um, where we have our offices in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Um, we're more than just a buyer's agent. Uh, these days, most buyer's agents are really just order takers. So uh, we provide a holistic approach to property. Um, we have a property strategy service, buyer's agency, property management, uh, wealth advisory, and a number of other services. Um, but I won't go into detail of those. We'll, we'll keep it fairly high level today. Um, I'm lucky enough to be uh, involved in property for over two decades now and, and Josh has been involved for close to a decade as well. So um, we've got the benefit of, of looking um, back and, and forward and, and being through these events before. And I guess the next slide um, there is, uh, the question was, uh, are we in unprecedented times? And certainly in some way we are, uh, you know, we've, we've never been in lockdown before. Um, so it is unprecedented. Um, but I guess in the scheme of things also, um, you know, these kind of events have, I guess, taken place before. At this stage, you know, I'm, I, one of my favourite sayings is, if it's not, um, not going to be around in five years' time, don't spend more than five minutes worrying about it. And that's how I see the coronavirus at the moment. I think um, in five years' time, it will be a distant memory. So I won't give it much time tonight. And, and in all honesty, I, I don't think it's going to change a lot of what we do and if anything the rules have changed but you just have to be a little bit more particular about the type of opportunities that you're looking for so this the slide you're seeing there at the moment goes all the way back um through the last couple of recessions we've had and as you can see there after each uh, each downturn uh you know property has performed quite well there's been a, a flight to blue chip safe assets um and uh, as a result of that um, the property markets generally perform well. A lot of investors uh, get back into property and take their money out of shares because it's a bit more of a safe option and a bit of a safe haven during those um, unfamiliar times. Uh, and uh, there's definitely opportunities to benefit there. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the strategic approach that we take um, to what we do. We've got a six-stranded approach and a lot of it is designed around, I guess, um, you know, narrowing, lowering the risk, building a, a stronger portfolio. We're not here to, to, to build cash flow or, you know, get a bargain or anything like that. We're here to build long-term sustainable wealth. So if we're buying for the longer term, we, we, we're not going to make decisions based on the last 20 minutes of news. We have to have a, 
a, a strategic approach. It's, it's not time to, I guess, go off a gut feel or, or something like that. It's, it's a time to make informed decisions. So the first distinction I'd like to make is we're always targeting um, high owner occupier markets. Um, owner occupiers tend to look longer term. They don't focus a lot on short term. That's more the investors. And that's why you see, uh, you know, investor markets and, and share markets quite volatile because if the market's not going well, they'll pull their money out and put it somewhere else. Uh, owner occupiers tend to ride those times out. I'm, I've got a young family. I'm sure most of us have as well. And if there's a financial crash tomorrow, we'll do whatever we can to keep a roof over our family's head. So a high owner occupied uh, percentage in a suburb is a very important thing. And not only that, I'd actually break it down one step further. And as you can see there on the screen, one thing we look at quite closely is the weekly family income um, in certain suburbs and certain areas. Uh, the area we like is on the left, uh, where the average income for that particular suburb is continually growing and getting higher, whereas the suburb on the right, um, unfortunately, the, it, people are just living paycheck to paycheck. They've got one form of income. Um, and, you know, in these types of financial instances, and also if it's just interest rate rises and rental rises, they, they struggle to keep up. Whereas the people on the left tend to have higher incomes, they actually have multiple streams of income as well. Uh, so there's a level of safety investing in those markets because someone may lose a job or get their hours cut, which is quite common at the moment, but they've got other forms of income. They may have a second job. They may get salaries and bonuses. They may have property or shares that they're getting a, a yield or a dividend from, uh, and it, they're not as affected. They've got higher buffers and they can ride these times out. And that's really, really important. If you're getting into areas with high investor and low incomes, like we talked about, then there's a, a hell of a lot of volatility. As part of that, I always say that uh, investors buy with their calculator, but owner occupiers tend to buy with emotion. And what we see in the suburbs we buy in quite often is that people will think nothing of buying a property like this on the left for say 600,000. And then on the property on the right, they'll think nothing of, uh, of knocking this property over and, and then spending another $600,000 uh, building their castle. Um, so, this doesn't happen out our outer areas where all properties are very, very similar, but in the inner city, particularly in Brisbane city and Melbourne within that 10 or 15 kilometer ring, you start to see these old homes make way for, for really big, expansive, modern contemporary homes. Um, and if you've got the little house tucked around the corner and this is happening three or four times in the street, um, the, the intrinsic value and the value of that property is actually going up in value and you probably haven't done a lot to it other than sit there and let the streetscape change around you. And that's, um, that's a really important distinguishment, again, between what an owner occupier would do and, and what an investor would do. The second, uh, the second point I'd like to make is uh, we never buy brand new or off the plan. They make very, very poor investments. Um, and they're predominantly sought after by, uh, I guess, investors. Um, I lose count of the, the amount of times I get messages on LinkedIn asking me to put my clients into these types of house and land packages or brand new homes off the plan, and they'll give me a twenty or $30,000 kickback. Um, and that's not putting my client in a good position. If they've paid six or $700,000 for that property and they've lost 30 grand straight away, it's, it's kind of giving the first couple of years growth away to the other side. So we like to Look, brand new at times can be potentially okay as long as you're not paying for marketing fees and commissions and kickbacks and things like that. So you've got to be very careful around that. Just a question on that, Brett. Um, sure. In terms of brand news, brand new builds or so forth, will it come back always to your first point about the location though? Like, if Yeah, absolutely. Some yeah, new great stock? point. Great point. So it, it does come back to the location. You know, you, you, if you're buying out in the middle of Cooma or halfway to Toowoomba where there's an abundance of land and we'll get to that shortly. It's the wrong area to be buying in, but there's nothing wrong with buying in a, in a, in a city location. As long as you're not paying for all those project marketing fees and commissions and kickbacks and rental guarantees, that's where the trap is. Okay, fantastic, thanks. Um, so number three, um, and this is a, a, good, a good reference point. Um, I'm sure if you asked yourself what part of the property goes up in value. Um, I think even the most beginning of investor would understand it's all about the land. So in Brisbane, we probably target a, an 80% land to asset ratio. So if we're spending, 
you know, there's an example there, but I know if we spend 600,000, we want the land value to be about 400 or 450. Um, that's the biggest percentage of the land, uh, of the purchase price, and the biggest part that's going to go, go up in price. The other side of things is if you, sorry, just one back there, um, Sebastian. Um, on the other side of the equation, if you spend 600, like we've done down the bottom there, and the land value is only 200,000, um, the biggest part of your assets actually going backwards. So I think if you, you check your home, uh, home rates and your home land value and things like that over the last 10 or 15 years, I can assure you your land's probably never gone down if you live in a, a blue chip uh, you know, suburb. The land doesn't go back in value. So if you can get a high proportion, there's a, a level of safety there um, where your property will, you know, I guess generally be able to hold, it, hold its value even in downtimes where if there's a lot of volatility around that, uh, those outer areas where the, the land value is quite low, um, you, can, you can probably get, get caught out. We usually base that on um, the, the question there just about market value. Yeah, we actually base it on that. the rates notice. Yeah, we, we base it on the rates notice. So um, it's generally another 5 or 10% more. For example, I know we purchased the property recently at 550. The rates value was 435, but a block of dirt one street away, pretty much identical, um, you know, had just sold for 500,000. So our client ended up buying a property really for, for $50,000 and, um, you know, uh, which is pretty much what the house value was because mm -hmm. the land was 500. Um, yeah, we're going to talk question. about um, valuations a bit later on as well. So yeah. we'll, we'll definitely deep dive a bit deeper on that, on that point. So thanks, Brett. Yep, no problems. Uh, so that's the, the land to asset ratio, vitally important. This is another thing, and getting back to my graph before, um, there's two particular suburbs here. One suburb's a high owner-occupier percentage suburb where there's a number of owner-occupiers with good incomes. The other one's a more volatile outer area. Um, the economy's not as strong. There's not as much jobs growth. The, the wages growth is quite low. So most people just look back over time. We like to go back over 20, 25 years to have a look how long um, that suburb's been around. But we, we look for growth, which is the obvious thing. But this is a fantastic opportunity to actually um, have a look at what happens in a financial downturn. So we, 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 we'll probably be facing one shortly. So if I can go back over 25 years and, and look back to the GFC, and this particular suburb lost about 2% in a GFC. Um, it lost about 8% in the floods in the economy with, with Brisbane, which was an isolated event to Brisbane. But usually 12 months later, you're kind of back to where you are and people don't sell their homes. You're not losing a bundle and, and it's upward and onwards from there. If you're looking at the suburb on the right, um, you know, more like 10% in the GFC. This is a mining town suburb. So, you know, upwards of 40 or 50% in the mining downturn. And you just don't recover from those kinds of things. If you're trying to build a portfolio over a 10 or 15 year period, look, you can handle a year or two poor growth before you get back on your, your, your horse again. But if you're losing 50%, that's, that's let another 10 or 15 years out of the game. And, and that's not what, um, what we're after. So it's very important to look back over history and, we wouldn't buy in a suburb if it hasn't been around for 20 or 25 years. The next thing is uh, the reason we like buying a property with a twist, something special about it. So um, there's a number of things you can do there, but I guess um, what we like to buy is obviously these, these inner city locations. So it might be a city view or something like that. Um, we want something that's going to increase demand for the property. So it could be a good school catchment there. Um, the Australian Financial Review just mentioned it's a, you know, a good school catchment, a top 10 school catchment could add about 4% to a house price. So that could be potentially 40 or $50,000 for an identical house just because it's on a different side of the road to another property and it's in a school catchment. So there's big picture twists and buying in those demand areas. Then there's also breaking it down further. And the reason I like buying property is because you can leverage into property, but you can also add value to property. And here's a property we purchased for a client that was originally a three bed, one bath um, and nothing structural here, just by putting up a couple of walls and changing a few things around, we were able to turn it into a four bed, two bath um, quite easily and, and add about 60 or $70,000 worth of instant equity straight away, which you just don't get uh, with, with uh, you know, new properties and, and off the plan and things like that. And these are these, Brett, uh, these is where the opportunities are for, for those tradies and those builders and those, you know, property sector to, to consider, you know, working on plans, working on strategies to get in, get in people's minds, get in front of people and ex explain how the value can be added and how they can uh, position themselves 
maybe in this new new um, new new market, I guess, going forward. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, you know, the ability to add value. I mean, look, I I don't do any, so it is good for the tradies and stuff like that. But even if you're not, there's there's ways to to add the value, even if you're not handy like myself. Um, but but it's a great way to do it. Um, and like I said, the last thing is that the value add potential. I find that the best asset you can buy, money can buy, is a high growth, high yielding or a high rentable property. But the only problem is there's no such thing. Um, it's either high growth or low yield or low growth and high yield. So, but by undertaking a high growth property in a fantastic location, you've got the ability to add this kind of value. It might be a, a great renovation like this. It may be a development where you're just moving one property away and putting two properties up. Um, and all of a sudden, by doing that, you're boosting the value of the property, boosting the cash flow, boosting depreciation and things like that, bringing that back into play. Um, and you're really focusing on incorporating those high growth, high yielding assets inside your portfolio. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how you're going to create wealth significantly faster. So I might just get Josh um, to talk a little bit more in a moment. But um, at the moment, look, we're, we're looking at supply and demand. and, and I believe that property goes up as a result of supply and demand. And this is a suburb in Brisbane called New Farm, where you can see there that um, it's a great definition of a strategy for supply and demand because there's no more available land there. There's, there's parks and reserves, but you can't just knock over 10 houses and build 100 more. Whereas the place on the right, you can just see all these new estates popping up. There's a huge amount of supply available. Um, and there will continue to be so for the next five or 10 years. So this is where land values are quite low. But on the other side, land values are quite high because there's a level of scarcity and rarity. So we're, we're always looking, and that's a good test when you're looking into buying a suburb, zoom out like you've just done there. And if there's any available land for the next five or 10 years, you want to try and avoid that. So that's the 80% of what we're looking for. Um, I guess I'll just quickly hand over to Josh to talk a little bit about um, the other 20% in terms of the streets and the areas and the location. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a massive point, uh, obviously, that a lot of points that Brett, have, Brett has made, but um, I think in particular, my job as a buyer's agent is obviously to pick that 80%, uh, get to the location and do a lot of research and, and work around that. But once we get to the property itself, um, it's about ensuring that the, the fundamentals are still the same um, and remain consistent in our approach. And that's, you know, avoiding things like main roads, uh, avoiding overland stormwater flow is a massive problem in Brisbane. Uh, can affect the structural integrity of a home long term and can cause investors all sorts of nightmares uh, in terms of cash flow costs in the future. Um, you know, there's various other things too that we look for, like a nice aspect. Um, once again, it always comes back to location um, as well. But um, in terms of on the ground, what we're seeing in Brisbane as well at the moment, um, I think a lot of people are interested and it's, the, it's a common question I get asked and that's in regards to how the market's going. Um, I think in regards to uh, how Brisbane's going at the moment, I mean, it, it always is the same from us. It's a consistent message and that's in the strong locations and the strong properties that we target for clients, there is always demand. And that's because of all these fundamentals Brett has spoken about. Um, I went for a property just two weeks ago in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, there were six written competing offers and the property went for $20,000 above the asking price. Uh, we missed it. Um, and that's something that I guess I wasn't really expecting, but really stamps home the, the points that we make um, about those fundamentals. Um, yeah. Thanks, Josh. Cheers, mate. Um, look, just quickly finishing off, um, I just wanted to share a case study and, and how our, I believe our strategic portfolio works and our plan. Rather than um, showing you the, the best of the best and the, the one-off things, I, I guess if we just go back to the last downturn, which was 2011 in the floods, and I picked this property up for a client using that six-stranded approach I mentioned in Holland Park, this one, um, where the market was very, very low in that 2011 period and over that five-year period, Brisbane only performed at 5.5% for houses. Um, this particular property um, did a lot better. If, you, if it had a board in Holland Park, which is one of the better suburbs in Brisbane, you would have got probably three times as much growth, which was 155 but because we narrow down the location, we only buy in the best areas and the best streets, just like where everyone, where you live, there's, there's good, good parts of the suburb and there's great parts of the suburb. By getting a good land value and a good twist and a good part of the suburb, we've got almost 23.7% growth. So it's almost four or five times more growth in a, in a downturn period in Brisbane 
So you can imagine, um, you know, why we like buying with that particular strategy because, um, you know, and the client didn't even have the opportunity to add any value to it. So um, that's how our strategy works in, in the bad times and, and obviously only works better in the good times when, when the market's performing well. Well, thanks, Brett. Uh, I think that um, wraps up most of your um, presentation tonight. Was there anything else you want to add before we move on to no. Michele from Michelle Romano? Yep. No, perfect. Thanks Mate. for your time, guys. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, Brett. Uh, and if we get some questions coming through, we'll definitely come back to you, you and Josh, okay? So uh, next speaker tonight is Michele Romano from Michelle Romano Accountants. Most of um, our mutual clients will obviously um, be aware of, of our close uh, Wealth Depot and Michelle Romano work. Um, we have similar, similar takes on how we advise and, and help clients. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Michele. Welcome, Michele. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thank you, and thank you guys uh, out there listening in. Um, so yeah, so so actually I just wanted to sort of intro everyone uh, in, into obviously who Neuro are, and uh, and then obviously run through a few things uh, that have affected me in my life from this, from a, a property investment side of things, um, and then and then run through I think the couple of insights uh, and current state of affairs and things. So so basically, yeah, look, uh, Muro is a two partner firm. Uh, we've been established now running for about 14 years, uh, head office over at East Brisbane. Um, we are your, your, your standard accounting practice uh, in, in doing your tax compliance, your structuring asset strategies, protection, um, and different different things. But yeah, of, of late, uh, maybe you can add uh, COVID-19 specialists. Um, so. Yeah, the last two or three weeks has been crazy, I suppose, in, in our life, uh, yeah, in everyone's lives, but um, you know, dealing with the changes that are happening uh, every day. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, but, yes, our, our firm is very proactive. Uh, we're a property-driven firm, hence, obviously, why we're, we're, we're talking to you guys tonight. Um, and I think, to sum us up, it's we practice what we preach. Uh, basically, that's that's our mentality. So, let me, let me get into a story. Um, Take you back uh, when I was uh, probably just coming out of out of uh, school, going to uni. Uh, I got into property market and built my first house when I was eighteen. Now uh, it was interesting because back around that time in the, in the sort of late nineties, uh, property markets hadn't moved too much. And I suppose what I want to get at tonight is the fact of timing. You know, because obviously timing I think is important. Uh, you know, as um, you know, Brett and Josh have said. They're investing in in high growth uh, areas, and and I love that strategy, and it's the strategy that we talk with our clients about. Um, but it's interesting, you know, timing. Uh, you know, I if I had a time in the market better, and I had a sold at the right time, I probably would would have walked away with a bit more uh, money in my pocket. Uh, the reality was is that you know I I, I got in, I got out, uh, I made a few dollars, and the next step for me was then go okay, well, how do I reinvest this money? Uh, and, and take a gamble. Now, I uh, was lucky and fortunate to jump in and, and pick up a property at Cooparoo uh, back around 2000, I think it was. Um, now, that specific property was an 809 square meter block uh, with an old uh, house on it, exactly like you've seen in the in the slides there with um, with Brett and Josh. Uh, the property I paid, I think, 244, I think, originally. Uh, now, during the course of its time, the, the value did grow. Uh, there was a point, obviously, at just before GFC that I did get offered a, a, a big substantial amount of money for it. Uh, I decided to just hold off. Uh, the GFC hit and uh, the property valuations dropped. So I, I probably lost around about 200 grand. Uh, and, I, and the reason I know this is that there were properties uh, beside me that were going to auction. Uh, and, and so, you know, we had written offers before and then we knew auction results. Um, so, but the reality is the long and short of it is if you hold property long enough, obviously your, your, your um, capital growth will be there. So uh, that particular property, um, as of probably two, three years ago, I knocked the house down, did the subdivision, built two houses uh, side by side, uh, and both those houses are rented out now. And obviously claiming the depreciation benefits that go with it. So yeah, I, I think you know, riding the market at the right time, uh, again, understanding the market, knowing when to buy and sell is important. Now, of course, with our clients, it's the same thing we're telling them uh, with, with property purchases, making sure that they're buying at the right time uh, and selling at the right time. The other thing that we, uh, or myself and, and my business partner did, we jumped into uh, commercial property. Um, so for those of you that uh, don't know much about the commercial space, it, it is a little bit tricky. Uh, it is, it is uh, definitely different to your residential situation. Um, 
the difference is obviously being that you know in a residential property it's it's quite easy to, to, to secure a tenant pretty quickly uh, in a commercial space it can take a lot longer you know sometimes up to one to two to three years to secure a tenant uh, and then obviously all the all the, the ramifications that go with it so you know it's um it's interesting uh, each each of them have their their costs and benefits uh, we jumped in that space obviously because we needed an office to to uh, operate our business from uh, the reality now with everyone working from home it's it's obviously made uh, things change, uh, you know, and this is, I think, what we're going to see roll out in the next, you know, uh, six months or so. Um, but again, if we're in for the long term, uh, you know, and we're dealing with with uh, you know growth properties, then I think obviously during riding riding that storm uh, will happen. And and I guess just wanted to sort of reiterate, you know, what Brett said is that you know the the, the main residence home. Uh, when you're looking at those graphs that he's talking about, you know, the the investor. Uh, right now is probably sitting on the fence. The the main residence buyer, the person who needs a home, uh, you know, roof over the head, uh, are still hanging around and still looking at buying. So, yeah, that that's I think uh, a little bit on my my story with investing. Uh, thanks for that, Michele. So so going forward now in terms of what's what's in the you know what we're dealing with in the current environment, um, you guys are, are all over this um, with your. Fantastic business updates and and up and providing that information uh, and the facts to to clients and anyone that's that's out there listening. Um, can you give a bit more an update of what's what's the latest with uh, with the recent uh, government release and um, uh, mandatory code of uh, conduct? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll run through that in a second. Um, I, I think you know I just wanted to share I suppose our property insights um, yeah. with with uh, the listeners. I, I think. Again, you know, our, our firm is, is driven by a passion for property. Uh, Kanye and I were lucky uh, about, a, about a year or two ago now uh, to have been included in a, uh, uh, a real estate license program, which, uh, you know, obviously we now have our, our real estate license to hand. But uh, the reason behind it was the fact that the, the kind of work that we do with our clients is, is all about giving them the, the upfront and uh, truthful information on a property purchase. So it's not uncommon for our clients to call us and go, uh, you know, I'm looking at this property. Uh, what do you think? You know, they wanted our opinion. So the fact that we've played in property for the last 20 odd years, uh, just cemented the reason for us behind it to go, you know, let's, let's go and get it. Uh, but we do have many real estate agent clients, um, and, and agents that we deal with and look after. So, you know, given the state of affairs right now, what I think, uh, I, I you know, and what I'm seeing, uh, is, is like I said before, there's two sides to this. You know, there's, the ones that are out there still buying, uh, and those ones are still buying, obviously the the house to live in. Uh, but the other side of it is is the ones that are obviously holding out, you know, in this hibernation uh, space, you know, with uncertainty. And you know, I, I say that with confidence because, like I said, you know, talking to the banks, uh, Mayor Angela will probably uh, reiterate this later on. But talking to different banks, uh, different financial institutions, um, brokers, there's a lot of mixed reactions out there. There's a lot of contracts that uh, are going through. There's a lot of contracts that are that are getting pulled, you know, and people are, are pulling the pin on. So, I think uh, the, the next sort of six months is going to be, you know, a, a big question mark for for the industry. Um, I know the REIQ are, are rallying hard at the moment uh, in that space, and um, yeah. So, I think, you know, using the parameters that the boys spoke about before, 100% agree with. Um, you know, buying the right location, proximity to CBD. Uh, city views, river views, all of those things 100% make sense. Uh, and, and I think, like I said, the kind of advice we give uh, at our firm is we want clients to make money. We want clients to grow. We want their portfolio, their portfolios to grow as well. And so, you know, if we don't like a, a particular property that they've presented to us, uh, we'll basically tell them straight out. Cheers, Michael. I know, I know how passionate you guys are about property and you actually do walk the talk. So... Um, all those insights that are available um, through your practice in terms of, you know, how best to, um, uh, you know, what, what are the steps involved in buying property, what you need to, to cover and the and, and, and reason why you know it because you, you've done it. And that's, that's, that's the important thing that um, you, know, you give that advice because you're passionate about it and you've, and you've actually gone out there and done it yourself. So I um, commend you guys on that and, um, and hopefully... Uh, your clients can always see the value in why they come to you guys in that regard. Um, so yeah, just to go, just to um, hopefully keep us uh, moving along, uh, can you now provide us with those updates? Yeah, sure. So, so you know, it's a hot topic at the moment, obviously, uh, the landlord and, and tenant debate. Um, 
for those of you who are keeping glued to the TVs and, and listening to PM broadcasts and so forth, um, obviously there's, there's there's two positions right now. Um, there's business as usual, obviously for uh, those landlords and tenants that obviously don't uh, are not affected by COVID nineteen, uh, and I believe you know there's 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 a smaller amount of them uh, every day, um, but for them yeah it, business as usual you know the tenant will keep paying their rents and the and the landlords will still pay uh, their mortgage repayments uh, given that obviously they do have the monetariums now to delay their their payments, but I think um, what what was released yesterday uh, from the PM is as classified small medium enterprise. Uh, who are now obviously caught under the job keeper program that they'll have access to and receive rent uh, waivers and deferrals. So that's an interesting one. Um, as far as we know, there is a mandatory code of conduct. Uh, I've, I've printed that off today and uh, started reading through it. It's a seven page document, um, you know, that, that obviously outlines what uh, the prime minister wants us to do uh, as far as landlord and, and tenancy agreements go. Uh, but basically, in summary, uh, you know, landlords, as far as I, I can read from all this, are going to be required to reduce their rents proportionate to uh, the trading reduction in the tenant's business caused by COVID-19. So, you know, if they meet the, the JobKeeper uh, program requirements, which is obviously their income had to drop by 30%, uh, then they will be entitled to, to uh, come up with these negotiation points. It's, it's odd note that it's, it's starting from the 3rd of April. Uh, and this will run, obviously, for the period of however long this um, JobKeeper program is operational for. But again, you know, it's interesting times. You know, like uh, the, the government's come out and said it's it's a six month uh, process. Uh, I think we'll see that it might be longer than that. Um, and obviously, from a recovery point of view as well. So, you know, that's to do with the commercial side of things. Uh, so, that for those of you out there listening tonight that are in the commercial space, uh, those are the the topics right now that are, that are affecting uh, you. The, what, what we don't know at this point is the residential rent um, situation, which is interesting because uh, on the same side of the fence, your landlords uh, are getting these monitoriums to not have to pay their uh, payments for six months. Um, but there is this talk out there that the, the tenant uh, doesn't have to pay their rent, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, it, it can't be that way. You know, the tenant will have to pay rents, uh, you know, for the period. And, and the monetarium that's on the landlord side is obviously going to just going to continue because they'll have to pay that and add it to their, to their uh, you know, final loan at the end anyway. So I know there are some packages out there for rent assistance. Uh, and I think talking to my real estate clients uh, and, and property managers, they need to be talking to uh, their landlords right now and getting information. They need to be talking to the tenant uh, and getting information. But uh, the reality is, is that, you know, I wouldn't be accepting anything unless the tenant came to the table and gave them uh, proper documentary advice to say that they are now on job seeker or Centrelink or, or benefits uh, and they can't pay the rent. So that's, that's, an, yeah, that's important, Michele, because um, also I've been hearing through the insurance grapevine that landlords that have uh, maybe rent default um, included in their policies, that unless they, um, you know, definitely get that information up front and can properly decipher and make make decisions about what what they should do next. They could actually void those policies. So it's a very very delicate situation at the moment, definitely in the marketplace. Yeah, I think. Look, what, what's your space? Uh, you know, for those of you on the panel that have uh, been following us, uh, I will have um, uh, another webinar running probably Tuesday night, uh, where we'll talk a bit further on, on this information, and um, we're trying to obviously get the head of REIQ to come on board as well and and uh, shed some more insights onto it. So yeah, watch this space. Um, but yeah, look guys, I wanted to um, uh, wrap it there, but uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Alfio Romano from Grasso Sales Romano Lawyers. Uh, we're lucky to have him on the line tonight. Uh, Alf has over 40 years experience in, in all types of law, uh, ranging from commercial, wills, power of attorneys, uh, estates and so on. Um, so welcome Alf uh, and, and please, can you share with uh, our listeners tonight uh, obviously, what sort of things they need to be considering with buying property uh, and, and anything else that's out there that we need to be thinking about. Thanks, McKelly. <laughs> yes, um, first of all, um, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, conveyancing is still alive and well. That although we're not actually having any more face-to-face -face contact and, and uh, particularly in signing documents and things like that, um, we are now working under the... Uh, uh, computerization space of PEXA, 
Um, and so that um, is ensuring the conveyancing continues on. Um, in my experience in the last two to three weeks and talking to other practitioners, um, we found that there's been a drop of about 50% in uh, new conveyancing matters coming in. Um, in addition, um, I'd be suggesting to most people who are looking to buy and or sell um, that they should be strongly considering talking to the, your lawyer, and obviously we can certainly assist there, before they actually sign anything, uh, particularly uh, to take into account potential clauses that should be inserted um, for what we now call the COVID clause. People uh, might remember that we used to have the Y2K clause in the year 2000 when we all thought our computers were gonna go blow up. Now we have a COVID clause as we're talking about putting into contracts. Um, and in addition, there's also clauses that I've seen and, and, and uh, drafted where um, uh, buyers look to see if they can get out of a contract if for any reason their lender's valuation doesn't come up to scratch. Um, so these sorts of things need to be addressed um, when people are looking to buy. Um, and as I said, we can assist with all that sort of stuff. Um, in addition to that, not just in the property sphere, but just generally in all contracts, um, people are all uh, worried about what happens with a contract if um, they can't perform it. Um, again, that's another area where we need, uh, people need to talk to us to um, examine what their contracts say. If they have a thing that's called, what is called a force majeure clause in the contract, force majeure is a fancy French term for um, uh, a, a term that means if there's an intervening force that uh, makes it impossible for people to operate or to, to perform the contract. Um, things like uh, acts of God, um, you know, uh, uh, strikes, lockouts, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, it, those sorts of clauses though don't even really cover the pandemic problem we have today. So again, um, you know, people need to think about what they do with their contracts. If they are uh, current contracts, they need to uh, assess whether they can or can't get out of them. Um, in talking with that, uh, the other areas of law that I'm finding at the moment that people are inquiring about um, uh, more so than in the conveyancing side is employment. Um, some people are looking at whether they can bring unfair dismissal claims for being terminated. Um, and that, and just so you understand, the, the Fair Work Act provisions still apply um, uh, and nothing that uh, the government has come out with yet has changed anything there. Um, the commercial tenancies that McKellie's just mentioned is also another area, obviously, that needs to be uh, carefully looked at. Um, one thing I might point out is that the National uh, Cabinet uh, Mandatory Code of Conduct that McKellie is talking about is not actually law. Um, and the only law that can actually be brought out is when the, each state introduces legislation to cater for whatever the Prime Minister has talked about. So basically, until the states legislate, um, it's really only up in the air. And what the, what the Prime Minister's been talking about is uh, he li he'd like the landlords and tenants to try and get together and resolve things and use this code as a basis to work things out. But there's nothing legally that enforces, that, that requires either a landlord or a tenant to do either. So again, it's, as Miguel said, it's a watch this space situation. We need to see what the legislation eventually is gonna say. Um, similarly with residential tenancies, um, you may have noticed that uh, QCAT is saying that even though the government has said uh, uh, you can't evict residential tenants, QCAT has said, well, the law hasn't changed. I can't, we've got to follow the law as it is. So as I say, it's, it's moving so quickly that we really need to keep our finger on the pulse. And I think you know, people uh, need to uh, contact us if they've got any problems with uh, these sorts of issues. Um, the other major issue that I've seen a lot of is debt recovery, where people are saying, well, what do I do? The guy owes me money. How do I get my money? Um, the thing to know there is that even though the government has mentioned that they uh, cannot bring a statutory demand against a company unless you're owed more than $20,000, and even when you do bring such a statutory demand, the company's got six months to address it rather than 21 days like it used to have, that only applies in that circumstance of statutory demands. It doesn't change the general law. 
the general law still is that if you owe me money, I can sue you. And if you don't uh, put a defence in or I sue you within 28 days, I get a judgment. And after the judgment, I can then enforce the judgment. Enforcing the judgment means um, uh, you can get the person to have to come to court and tell what they own. Um, they can be, uh, they can have a gun, a she, and they can also um, have the court sheriff come around to, to the company or to the debtor's place, grab their assets and sell them. So all those issues are still out there and the government really hasn't addressed any of that at this point. Um, but anyway, I'm going a bit off tangent, uh, we're talking about property. Um, but as I say, I think um, uh, if you're going to look at buying anything, you really need to consider what goes in the contract. Uh, don't sign a standard REIQ contract. You really need to address uh, all these other issues before you sign. And we're certainly there for anybody who needs to uh, uh, get any assistance. You can contact me on uh, my email, it's probably the best. And that email address is a Romano. it's all one word, A-R-O-M-A-N-O, at gsrlawyers.com.au, or through Sebastian if uh, you can't get me. Thanks, McKellen. Well, thank you, McKellie and uh, Elf. Uh, appreciate you both um, coming on tonight and, and, and you know, providing us your insights and what's happening in your lanes, um, especially you, Elf. I, I obviously admire you. I've, 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 you know, you've seen me uh, grow as a man, a boy into a man, and obviously, and uh, we work closely together with a lot of mutual clients, and uh, yeah. I definitely value your input. So please, um, anyone out there looking for, you know, a legal team that's, that's uh, again, you know, involved heavily in, in the property market, that knows property because they live it, and passionate about it, um, Elf and his team at GSR Lawyers are definitely uh, the guys to, um, to to talk to. And Thank thanks you. again, McKelly, for your your words. So it's always appreciated. Okay, oh, so so now we're going to jump over to Mari Angela Stigniti. Um, I've known Mari Angela again for for many 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 years. Uh, her and her, her beautiful family. Um, and uh, Mari Angela's going to uh, give us a bit more insight about what's happening in the lending space. Uh, Mari Angela works with uh, Mendigo and Adelaide Bank. Um, after uh, a very, very long and illustrious career at uh, CBA. So um, yeah, over to you, Marty Angela, and, and thank you, you're welcome. Thank you, Sebastian, and um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, where do I start and where do I end? But um, as Sebastian said, I'm in lending. I specialise in owner-occupied and investment um, properties um, in lending, and um, it's um, it's been a bit rough the last um, few weeks for for a number of people, but um, as Michele said, um, it's business as usual for some of us. And um, I can say that um, my clients, I've been lucky enough that my clients um, are still in a, in, a, in a space where they can actually still borrow, and um, even with pre-approvals in place, I mean they're struggling to buy properties. To be honest, to find. Um, anything um, that suits their needs, whether it's an investment property or a residential property, um, they simply can't find anything. Uh, in saying that, I suppose now with the situation that we have at hand, um, it may be a little bit easier, but um, again, um, it depends. Like the boys um, said from Metropole, it does depend um, in the areas. Everyone wants to live in New Farm. Uh, I live in New Farm, so that's why I was through that in. But um, yes, it is a bit hard um, at the moment. What I thought I'd touch on, just to be um, just quick, is basically how processes are done now with um, the coronavirus um, situation um, at hand. Um, normally, you do need um, you know, an, an application now. We have to have a declared living expenses. So you have to, I sit with the client and we go through their spending um, for the last month. And, um, and then from that, we then work out um, calculations, you know, quarterly or annual um, spending as, as, as we, we look at, as we see fit. Um, the pay slips, obviously, the last two pay slips, what we now have to do is what we call a COVID check. So when you call the employer up um, to confirm, obviously, um, the status of employment uh, with the potential clients, um, we have to actually now ask um, what is their COVID um, plan, if the business will be um, still uh, um, working in the next six months, what, is, what happens to, say, my client um, with his pay, uh, will he be on holiday leave, 
payment? Will he be on um, long service leave payment? So I do have to have now a conversation with the actual employer. So it is a little bit hard, um, but unfortunately that's just the way the times are. Obviously the client does know that I am going to ring up his or her boss. So, um, you know, they are aware it's not something that's done behind their back, obviously. That all then goes um, into my minutes of preparing the actual um, application uh, to the credit team. With the client, I have then a discussion uh, about an exit strategy. So you normally have an exit strategy discussion. Now it's a COVID exit strategy discussion. So what is your plan if it happens that you do lose your job? Or what is your plan if it happens that your wife or your partner lose their job? How are you going to go forward, especially in owner-occupied, uh, paying uh, your debt? So we do have to have now extra discussion, which say three weeks ago, a month ago, six weeks ago, I never um, had to have. I'm lucky in that um, my clients, like I said, are still in a comfortable position uh, to still go ahead with um, their contracts. And um, approval for me has been a little bit difficult the last couple of weeks, probably so not in the banking side of it, but more the valuation side of it. And um, a valuer said to me the other day, we are now in a coronavirus evaluation mode. So I don't know what that means, but um, I'll let you know in a few weeks when um, these settlements go through, uh, hopefully with valuation as I need them. But um, I'm not expecting that the valuations will come back as I, as I want them. But um, like Michele said, and I'll quote that, I really like that, it's, it is business as usual. And um, that's, um, that's where I am. You can find me um, through LinkedIn. Um, or through Sebastian, if any of you would like some more information or need any help um, in any um, lending. Um, obviously, uh, Bendigo Bank is a bank, so we do have commercial, we do have business, we do have um, branches uh, still opened, and i um, happy to help. Maria Angela, we just got a, thanks for that. Um, just got a quick question um, that, that'd be great for you to um, provide some um, some insights around uh, from, from Russell here. Yep. Uh, are the mortgage insurers making borrowers jump through more hoops if the LBRs are over 80%? Uh, yes. And um, my, I, I can't speak with experience on that because I'm, my clients are quite don't need LMI. But yes, I have heard my colleagues talk of, um, of situations where it has been hard, a, a lot harder for them. Okay. And uh, another question here from uh, one of our um, uh, esteemed uh, guests, uh, Mr. Connie Mashillo. Uh, how's the COVID um, deferrals working with your bank, with Bendigo? What's your, been, what's your experience and, and what's happening on the ground there? Sorry, I missed that, Sebastian. Sorry, what, what, what was that? What are the deferrals, the COVID deferral and the loan deferral requests? What's, what's been the, the process and in, in the... In the any um, experience that's been ex um, that Bendigo Bank are, are currently ex are seeing at the moment? Look, I haven't heard anything um, negative. I know that they've obviously got calls, but I think with a lot of people, they think that it is easy for the bank to just put them on this um, deferral system, but they do have to actually prove that, you know, they've lost their jobs, prove that their salary has dropped, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So um, we do have a dedicated team um, for that in place, and, and all banks do. And of course, all banks um, have their own policies. So even though we're all banks, we all have different systems and different policies that we have to abide by, obviously, as you all know. Okay. Thanks, Emma. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, um, stay around. There'll probably be more questions a bit, a bit as soon as people start processing. Sure. Thank you very much again. All right, well, that then um, pretty much wrap up our, per, our sort of expert panel. I'm just going to provide some closing uh, remarks around um, a sort of a balanced, uh, a balanced approach to property investing. And, and also as a financial advisor, um, we will obviously have the capacity to provide clients with the many, many solutions in, in this space. Um, so direct property, as we've been talking about tonight, is obviously a big part of a lot of our client portfolios. Um, so that's what we thought we'd pre present most of the time on, but just to, just to um, provide a bit of a balancing um, um, measure, um, I probably wanted just to give you an update about what's happening in the listed property market. 
Um, and this is where we're talking about retail space, uh, office space, industrial space, um, et cetera. And um, we normally help clients get into, the, into these markets um, either through um, managed funds, um, ETFs, or listed securities on the ASX. Uh, so there's numerous ways to to invest in property. Um, so, so not all strategies obviously fit everybody, and that's why we we take a very uh, personal and uh, you know, tailored approach to creating investment portfolios for our clients. Um, but I wanted to share some of the some of the recent um, um, updates from from one of our uh, managed fund providers, and that's um, APN uh, Property Group. Um, they uh, they work in the listed um, real estate sector. And this, is, this came out actually out of, their, out of their presentation to advisors today. And I thought it was quite interesting just to get their take on where some of the sectors, um, what, 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 they, what their um, viewpoint was on some of the sectors. So, so I don't want to harp on too much on this stuff because we, we've got uh, only probably another five, 10 minutes to go and, and I want to make sure we get, get across to all the questions that are coming through. But you know, there's definitely sectors in the marketplace that, that will still provide opportunities. Um, and, and, and they're being um, around industrial spaces um, and uh, the different one to look out for is service stations. We, we find that because they're quite defensive in nature, that's where, where we're looking at to provide uh, stable income streams and, uh, and obviously you know, any growth opportunities. But as you can see, the retail sector is going to, in, their, in our opinion, is going to be weak um, as, we, as we're feeling already with a lot of you know, shutdowns. And uh, we probably feel that um, you know, as the, as the team already sort of discussed today, the residential market definitely is going to have some uh, have some uh, concerns over um, valuations and obviously trying to find that right property. But like Brett and Josh have obviously mentioned tonight as well, um, there's definitely those opportunities out there. It's all about creating the right strategy, the right investment strategy um, around that to make sure that you're, you're ticking off your checklist, your criteria, and obviously. Um, with the team that we've got here tonight, um, you know, we've got all the bases covered. Um, we can definitely help anyone that's looking for um, um, exposure into the property market, uh, be it across commercial, residential, or just general uh, uh, property, property listed markets. Um, so I, I guess um, I would like to take this opportunity just to also um, emphasize that now is the time to really assess your investment strategies and your risk profiles and to make sure that you're making rational calm decisions around your investment portfolios. Um, obviously we're here and we're helping clients um, basically get, get through these uh, uncertain times. Um, and it's all about uh, creating, uh, I guess, a, a very clear pathway around, um, you know, what is, what is your objective and what, what, is, what is it that your um, investment portfolio is, is meant to achieve to help you achieve your um, either short term or medium term, but more importantly, long term goals around um, how you're going to be financial independent um, when the time comes when maybe it is time to retire. So that's what we want to focus on. Um, and that's, that's, that's why we, we've had the team here tonight to really drive home that it is about the strategy, that it is about um, knowing your, your objectives and coming, coming to terms with your cash flow and your budget and then how, how, working within those uh, parameters and framework to hopefully make the best decisions possible. So I just want to re uh, quickly go through some questions here now for the panel. Um, so we've spoken about uh, that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Good comment, cool comment there, Sebastian. Uh, says here, what a team. The guys can find you a property. The guys yeah. can see if you can afford it and how to buy it. The beauty amongst the beasts who can get you the money to buy. And then last but not least, the person who makes you buy it properly and don't get into legal trouble. It's pretty That's cool. right. That's exactly right. And I think anyone that's definitely looking into property as an investment or even, you know, even be it a first time buyer or just a, you're doing a property deal, it's important to have a team of advisors around you that know what they're doing. They do it every day and they've got your best interests at the, at the core of what they're saying and, and doing for you. Um, I mean, the team around tonight has more than nearly, you know, 60, 70 years worth of experience accumulated. Um, that's not easy to come by. And, um, uh, that's why we've been able to, to uh, you know, make sure our clients do make the best decisions. And, and, and sometimes, you know, if they aren't the best decisions, we've got the team around us to get through that, get through those challenges, to understand maybe what, where, the, um, where the end game may be. So, but there, that, that was a great comment. Yeah, thanks, McKelly. Um, 
Mali Angela, there's a question here around about uh, interest rates. Uh, what are you seeing in that yes. area at the moment? Look, um, I'm in. I'm a mobile relationship manager, so we are um, we're able to actually offer good rates. So I haven't had any complaints up to date. So um, I don't want to be quoting any, just in no. case. But are we seeing? Good. We're definitely seeing uh, twos in front of rates, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Got any other questions? Um, what's interesting? Oh, yeah. sorry, I was going to say, what's interesting no? is that um, people are not fixing, and it's remaining variable, and everyone's got a um, a set off account and redraw facility happening as well. So, which you would never have seen that a few years ago, whereas now that's what clients want for their lifestyle, yeah. We have those conversations quite regularly with clients around, you know, where they should fix or variable and how, this, how the loan structure should be in terms of offset accounts or redraw. Offset accounts have definitely been um, something quite interesting in the marketplace in terms of product and mm -hmm. design. Um, and I think they've worked quite well for the average punter because mm. it virtually provides a, a risk-free return um, on their cash. So, so we're, mm. we'll obviously, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of product innovation, maybe over the next few months or years mm. um, with obviously a changing landscape. Um, yeah. Just, I just want to um, um, shout out, we, we've had a comment there from Michael Garland to the team at Metropole. Um, we've got your details, so we'll definitely be in touch with you, Michael. So thanks for that. Um, you, guys, any you, other final comments you'd like to add before we maybe wrap it up? Or I think he asked a question about um, uh, how much the Metropole charge for buyer agent fees yes. in Melbourne up to 500000 Yeah, you want to mention that, Brett? You have, you're comfortable with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, get in contact. There's a number of different options we look at, it depending on the budget and the city and if it's a home or a, an investment. So uh, more than happy to talk around around those fees as well and what, what you're required to, to do, yeah. Yeah, but but essentially the fees are transparent. It's all open. Yeah, nothing's hidden. Um, Absolutely, again, that's it's all what up we like. Um, you, you said it before as well. You guys don't take any kickbacks from any developers, um, and that's what we like to hear. We don't um, we don't believe in that in those models, and we definitely wouldn't want our clients to be um, you know victims of, of you know price gouging or just you know inflated prices. So so thanks for that, Brett and, and uh, Josh for insights. Sebastian, I've got a, got a question for Maria Angela. So, and again, I, I don't know if this is um, the case, obviously I'm not in the banking sector, but uh, the reality with these monetarium, so people are putting their things on hold for six months. Um, what is the, the option, I suppose, for you know, clients that are looking at buying property? Because you know, if, if I was to sign up and put all my things on hold for six months, uh, what is the opportunity for me to then to be able to borrow in addition at that same time? You know, am I going to be stopped? Is what, what's the bank's uh, viewpoint on that? Look, everyone's um, it's case by case, and um, it's uh, yeah. Look, I haven't come. I, I can't even answer it because I haven't come across anyone or heard anything um, to the contrary. So it's 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 one of those things, I suppose, where it's um, it, it's a, it, everything's a risk. So if, if, there's not, if the security is good, it's a good risk. If the security is bad, we're not going to take that risk. So I don't know if even that makes sense, but it's, um, yeah, no, I haven't really heard anything scary, Michele. Yeah, well, that's, that, that's my concern because I think if, um, yeah, a lot of people take up that option and, and do put it on hold. Uh, mm. I, I know with the, one of my uh, bank accounts, uh, they, did, they did say that to me and they said that um, I, I may not be able to re-borrow uh, once I'm in that in that space, so I just yeah, you know, and, that, and that's yeah. that's what I'm thinking yeah. from a, a purchasing perspective. You know, most people in the investment world, world are going to say, well, I don't have the money uh, or I can't get access to it, so therefore, you know, I have to hold for a, for a six month period. So yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, obviously there's developments on this stuff every day. Um, you know, after Easter, hopefully we get a bit more information, which which will help. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mm. doesn't give us a a confident pathway to, so to speak, to, to, to want to go and jump and do things um, at this at this stage. So. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a bit scary. Oh, well, we're all facing it, so we're all, we're all in it together. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>
Sebastian, I can't hear you, mate. I think you're yeah, wrong. Yeah, that's all right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I just want to check in. Any any closing comments? Any, anyone's welcome to talk so you know, um, provide anything. Otherwise, um, we'll leave it there. But again, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, Brett Warren, Josh Sawyer from Metropole. Michele Romano from Michelle Romano Accountants. Alfred Romano from GSR Lawyers. And Marley Angelestini from Bendigo. I appreciate all your time and effort. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, speaking to you guys all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Well done. Thank you very much. Peace out. Bye. Bye.